Community Cats podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats podcast. I am your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. This is going to be the last show in our series of Best Of for December 2018. We chose Kim Freeman, a professional missing cat finder. She's a real dynamo. She's out there and helping folks be able to find their missing cats. Great tips, great information. She's got a wonderful ebook. I found it to be a fascinating interview and one that I enjoyed so much that I have asked Kim to join us at 2019 online cat conference, January 25th through 27th. If you have not signed up for it, please go to onlinecatconference.com and join us that weekend to learn everything about cats for two and a half days really because we're going to have IMO show coming in on Friday night to kick off the event and then two days of packed meetings. If you can't make all the meetings online, that's okay. They are all recorded so you can tune in later and check them out. But anyway, back to today's show with Kim Freeman and feel free as always to reach out to me at Stacy at communitycatspodcast.com. If you ever have any questions, comments, or suggestions, take care and enjoy this interview. Today, we're speaking with Kim Freeman. Kim is a professional missing cat finder. With a background working with shelters to solve cat behavior issues in home, she's combined her knowledge into a very niche specialty, Lost Cat Search and Rescue, and she's written an educational how-to book about it. Using Lost Cat Profiling, Kim coaches people all over the world through recovering missing and community cats with extraordinary success. Her goal? get missing cats found before they end up in colonies and shelters. Recently deemed the world expert in lost cat recovery, she's solved cases all over the U.S., as well as Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Brazil, Latvia, and Switzerland. Find out about her own cat, who she trained to help her track cats, plus some of her most challenging cases and reunions at www.lostcatfinder.com. Kim, I'd like to welcome you to the show. Thank you, Stacey. Honored to be here. Yeah. So it, this is a fantastic bio. So um, obviously, you know, you don't magically become a specialist at finding lost cats. So how did you get interested in this area and develop your passion for cats? Well, the passion for cats didn't have to be developed. <laughs> um, you know, that was started when I was a kid. I actually lost, our family lost our cat when I was a kid. That maybe is how I got started. Clancy was, we searched all over the neighborhood for Clancy, but he was trapped in the attic. So happy, happy ending. But that kind of taught me my first lesson. I remember after that, riding around in the car with my dad and seeing all these lost cat, missing cat posters. I guess I was probably about 10 and I said, Daddy, when I grow up, I'm going to find them all. And, you know, my mother thought that was hilarious. But, you know, now she says, hmm, maybe, maybe that was a good idea after all. In 2008, the real start was in 2008 when I lost my cat, Mr. Purr. I lived on a horse farm. And I got really terrible advice and very little support from anybody. And, um, you know, it's kind of, it, it, you feel alone. It's very stressful. If I had listened to people's advice, my cat would have died in the shed he was trapped in. And, you know, that was my firsthand experience. So I learned what owners feel like when their cat's missing. And, you know, dog owners get tons of support. The community rallies and everybody's out trying to help find the dog. But, you know, cat owners get comments like, well, a coyote probably got it. Right, right. Or I'll figure out his own way home or somebody else, someone else took him in, you know, that that kind of thing. Yeah, it's it's funny how we all have these stories where somehow a line is crossed and we it's pushed us to the point of, okay, we've got to do something about this now. I mean, we all have these stories 
I've gone up to situations and I'm like, no, 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 I'm not seeing this ever again in my lifetime. And it sounds like that was one of your stories where you crossed that line and you said, I have to make a difference because no one else is going to do this this way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's excellent. And thank you for taking that step and making a difference and helping so many more cats out there and families really that need your help. I mean, it's families more need the guide to be able to help them through, through the process of, of trying to find their cats. So you do have a, a very specific process that you go through trying to make things seem simple. Can you just sort of walk us through a little bit about some of the key components of the things that, that you go through with a family after they've lost their cat? Well, I, I generally start with the profiling. The first step is to get them up to speed and educated. So I have this online booklet search guide, How to Find a Lost Cat, which is a download. So I ask them to at least skim through that, watch the video, which explains, you know, the trapping and the wildlife cameras, the how-to stuff, some of the technology that I use. And then we get on the phone once they've read the book and I've read their profile on their cat and determined kind of a strategy. You know, every cat and situation is different. So I kind of coach them through the key things they need to do and in what order based on their cat's personality and, you know, indoor or outdoor. Do you know of any other organization that does cat profiling? Like specifically what I I know what profiling is, but specifically how does one profile a cat? Well, I have a questionnaire and the, the questions are, are, kind of coded so that I can determine the problem. There are like eight probabilities of what could have happened to a missing cat. And the questions are set up to determine which of those is the most likely and how that particular cat's going to behave when in a displaced new environment so that we can determine, you know, like, for example, this is, this is a kind of a basic one, but you know, some cats are the ground dwellers and when they're nervous or stressed or someone comes over, they go under the bed, but some cats want to go up. And when they're nervous, they want to get on the refrigerator and get up high. Depending on which type of cat it is, that helps guide where you search. What are the most likely places that cat's going to be? Is he down a storm drain or is he up a tree? Very interesting. So using their in-house behavior, you can actually determine what their behavior might be outside. Right. It predicts also how far they will travel, how long they'll hide, whether they'll approach a person outdoors, all those things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very, very helpful. The profiling is key. Nobody wants to fill out my form because it's, you know, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 pages maybe. And, you know, when you have a lost cat, you're so stressed. You don't want to sit down and fill out a form, but it really, really does help. So there's the work that you do. You do primarily one-on-one working with folks or are you mainly training other people to help assist folks in their community or a combination of? No, I'm full time either going out, you know, putting on my boots, loading up the truck and going out to search for cats or I'm training my cat or I'm coaching people on the phone. Mm -hmm. That pretty much takes up 14 hours a day. And you mentioned that you work with your cat. So how does your cat help you with with tracking cats? Well, Henry is trained to track scent. So if I get a case of an indoor-only cat who got outside, Henry will can follow the scent trail and show me where they're hiding. He only goes on cases if they're indoor only cats, because a cat that goes out all the time, their scent trails like a spider web everywhere. But yeah, Henry did a great, I remember his very first case. He, he walked, I was like, no, 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 Henry, you need to look over here. And he turned around the opposite way and found the kitty where I didn't think she would be. And he tracked that kitty in like 10 minutes. Oh, <laughs> it's good for you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So I don't question him anymore. He gets to go wherever he wants to go and I follow him. And how did he learn to follow the scent? Well, he was already a very scent focused cat. He was a rescue cat, meaning I got him from a shelter. 
And now he rescues cats, which I think is nice. But I clicker trained him with using cat fur. Oh, okay. And he was already very interested in sniffing things. I just sort of redirected it. And was it, had you seen somebody else do this with their cat? Or I, I've never heard of this necessarily. So I'm just trying to f- wonder, did you develop this on your own? Are there other people who use cats to track? No, I I do know that there is a cat that is trained in avalanche search and rescue. They um, did a story on cats and their ability to to track and their scent discrimination. And they featured Henry. Henry and this other kitty that's, that's I don't know, in Colorado maybe. Um, he's That's the only other search cat I know of. But a lot of my training was through Missing Pet Partnership. And Cat Albrecht pioneered the whole thing of teaching dogs to track lost pets. But dogs don't find cats. They hardly, they might get direction of travel, but they never can walk up on a cat unless it's trapped in a shed. But a cat can. A cat can walk up to a cat. So since that's all I do is cats, I'm like, I don't, I don't want to search dog. Search dogs chase cats away. So my idea was that I would try to train Henry and see if it would work. And it has, it's worked well. I think he's the only search cat there is for lost cats. Hmm. Very cool. Very cool. And yeah, I have a nice picture of you here holding Henry and he's a very handsome black and white kitty. He's very, very handsome with a nice pink nose. Yes, I think he is. (laughs) He thinks so too. Today's episode is sponsored by Space Kitty Express, your one-stop shop for exotic cat drugs. Everyone's heard of catnip, but what about valerian root, tatarian honeysuckle, or silver vine? Space Kitty Express specializes in offering these hard-to-find catnip alternatives, both in their herbal form and stuffed into a variety of reusable toys. Their herbs are 100% pure, not like those quote-unquote catnip blends you might find in a pet store. Their tartarian honeysuckle wood is cut fresh and kept frozen to lock in its citrusy scent. Their silver vine exudes a mintiness that tingles the nostrils. Their organic valerian root is so musky that they've had to blend it with organic lemongrass so that human noses can tolerate it. Cats can definitely tell the difference between these quality herbs and that stale catnip from the big box store. Visit SpaceKittyExpress.com and watch videos from satisfied feline customers. Use coupon code COMMUNITYCATS, all one word, at checkout to receive 10% off your purchase. That's SpaceKittyExpress.com with coupon code COMMUNITYCATS. Doesn't your cat deserve the best? Spoil them today at SpaceKittyExpress.com. Did you miss the 2018 online cat conference that we held in January? Or would you like to share some of the conference webinars with friends? You can now purchase the presentations and share them with colleagues and friends. Just visit our recordings page, which is under the resources tab, to access webinars from some of the leading personalities in feline welfare today. They're sure to give you and your cat-loving friends great ideas on ways to help even more cats. Check it out at www.communitycatspodcast.com. We were talking a little bit before we started the the interview a bit about sort of the role of shelters and the role that they play with regards to lost and found cats. You had talked about sort of a a three-part triangle of areas that really shelters need to be engaged in in order to help return their cats back to their owners, which at this point in time is a incredibly low percentage of cats that once they hit the shelter, making it back to their home, the percentage is really quite, quite low. Can you chime in a little bit on your thoughts about what things shelters can do in order to get that return to owner rate up higher? Part of it is prevention, of course. And, you know, that's not real sexy, but preventing the cat from showing up at the shelter is is key. So, you know, I would like to see shelters offer a link to my how to find a lost cat book so the owners can download it and find their cat before it ends up at the shelter. And, you know, usually the cat isn't going to end up at the shelter that week. Cats don't walk up to strangers who then pick them up and take them to the shelter. You know, that, that happens for dogs, not cats. But, you know, in my experience, I have found cats showing up at the shelter two years after they were lost. So it's still a cat showing up at the shelter. It's just later. So giving the community a resource on what to do 
if they lose their cat. Going and looking for the cat at the shelter the day after it's lost is, I wouldn't say a waste of time, but it's not the best use of time, in my opinion. So educating the owners and then keeping the owner involved via email. We talked about, you know, sending out one email blast every day of whatever cat intake there was to owners that sign up once they've lost a cat. I also believe in return to field. I think that's huge. I I would like to see more shelters try that instead of just taking in any cat that's considered a stray. In my opinion, there are no strays. If you think about it, a, a cat that has strayed away is a lost cat. And, you know, if you see a cat on the street, it's, I, I carry a scanner in my truck. So if I can, I scan any cat that's outside and see if there's an owner. I wish more people would microchip. I would love to see shelters offer in-home cat microchipping. If, you know, with one van and one volunteer and a microchip, they can be gotten for like four ninety nine each. If people would offer in-home microchipping, more people would chip their cats. About half of my lost cat cases, probably more like 75%, the cat is not microchipped. And, you know, the owner's like, well, I just never got around to it, or it was an indoor-only cat, I never thought she'd get out. You know, there are lots and lots of reasons, but probably the main one is it's just a hassle to take your cat to the vet, get them in the carrier, get them to the vet to get microchipped. Yeah, no, I think that, you know, getting a, a higher population of our cats microchipped would be really, really helpful. Um, I'm part of a small group outside of Boston, and we offer two clinics a year where it's free microchipping and free rabies vaccination. And um, we get 100 cats at each of the clinics, so at least it's a decent number of people, but, you know, they got to pack pack them up and put them in carriers. And sometimes the carriers aren't the most solid carriers around. And so, you know, we have a lot of extra carriers on hand, but it's a, it's a way to get education in the community too. So that does work out pretty well, but yeah, I mean, that's just a little percentage of what the whole cat community size is in there, in that, in that urban area. I, just a quick question. Of the cats that you work with, how many or what percentage of them are spayed and neutered versus not spayed or neutered? Well, there's good news there. I would say, wow, you know what? Recently, I've had three in a row that were unneutered males, which is very unusual. I would say 98% of the cats that I find or that I'm hired to, to help with are neutered or spayed. So that's good. Because a large percentage of the cats that are coming into shelters are not spayed and neutered beforehand upon entry. And so that's one of the things that I would, you know, I would be more, you know, if a cat comes in that's not spayed or neutered, I'm more interested in sort of trying to figure out its source than if a cat's already spayed and neutered and it's healthy and it looks good. I you know, definitely I'm going to say it should go back to its neighborhood because it's, it needs to, you know, go home. But where there's a not spayed or neutered cat, I hesitate substantially. Well, obviously I'm not going to return the cat unless the cat's already spayed or neutered because it's going to be contributing to cat overpopulation. So there, there, the, the gray area enters with me more in, in that area, because if you have an unneutered male cat living in the house can be kind of rough, you know, and, 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 uh, and, you know, uh, unspayed female can be very rough living in the house too. So do you see any correlation between the, um, unneutered cats and feral cats? Are you? Well, the feral cats are usually, you know, long-term descendants, I guess I would say. So they are litters after litters of, who I call Adam and Eve, who are potentially the the potentially abandoned cats that are owned by folks that can't afford to get them spayed or neutered. So Mm -hmm. my objective is always to get in there and get Adam and Eve spayed or neutered before anybody enters onto hard times and and has to move or has to, you know, it's always in areas of very transient population. 
to prevent the birth of the kittens. But then it, it's it's very hard to determine whether there's a cat out there that does need assistance versus not. Feral cats behave differently. So, I mean, we don't see as many in Massachusetts. We're not seeing that many, as many feral cats as we are sort of friendly displaced cats. So you're getting in the shelters predominantly friendly, unneutered, and unspayed cats. In the shelters, we are actually getting, well, substantially less cats, by far less cats. And the, But the ones that are coming in are friendlier, yes. Yeah. And then, um, the, because the ferals are, any feral cat, they're getting um, TNR, trap, neuter, return. So, um, and, but it's, it's, it's very different. I mean, in, in Massachusetts, our shelters in January, some of the large ones only had like three cats in their big, big rooms. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 there's, it's been so aggressive with the spay neuter for the, um, low income community. That's what's making the biggest difference in that population issue is really making spay neuter accessible for all income levels. Well, I wish that were the case nationally. Yes, I, and it's my dream. It's a hope. It's a it's a hope of ours. And one hope, other thing that uh, a model that I wanted to to touch upon was in uh, some information you sent me that the Marin Humane Society at one point in time they had their return to owner rates as high as thirty two percent. Yeah. And so, and that was just with. Not much, but some focused effort on the lost and that that lost and found list or that big book that we have sitting on our tables in our shelters that they just focused more of their efforts on that. Or was there something specific they did that really made that change? They had one person totally dedicated to the lost and found project. I mean, most shelters are all about, or in my experience, Mm, adoption and maybe some TNR if there's a grant, but they kind of, you know, the RTO is the national average is 2% for RTO. And that's why that 32% number, it may not sound huge, but it is compared to the national average. So yeah, um, they did that with a binder, basically being able to the match up the lost and found and, you know, track the ones that cat lost and, 2015 found in 2016. That's excellent. And one of the things uh, in a presentation that I saw of yours, you had this great little system for a shelter. Is this, is this something that is available on your website, the information about sort of how to organize the data that's coming in for, you know, rather than just putting that flyer in a notebook, a way to organize things so that there's a better way for us to be able to track the owners and the cats and then the incoming cats and to make sure that we're able to find a match when it comes through. Yeah, that is not, my website is dedicated just to lost and found cats, but there is a page with my RTO, increasing RTO for shelters. And I am available to talk to shelters or send them this presentation on, on how to set up the system. I thought that seemed really cool and it, it didn't seem overwhelming at all. It seemed like a very good system because unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, we have volunteers oftentimes heading up our front desks and that's usually where the lost and found information comes. I personally know one woman who has worked for years volunteering at a shelter and that's where she developed her lost and found passion. And so she helps facilitate all around Eastern Massachusetts, helping people with their lost cats and finding them. And so, you know, but it's from that frontline exposure that if she had a better system, she might've felt more empowered to help at that place. So I think that having a system that we all could adapt would be really quite tremendous. Yeah, I would I would love to help shelter set up a system like this. It's really, really simple and almost free. So if folks are interested in finding out more about you, they should just all go to lostcatfinder.com. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Um, lostcatfinder.com is the website. And then my Facebook page, whenever I have another happy reunion story, I post them on my Lost Cat Finder Facebook 
Excellent. Excellent. Well, definitely. We shall check you out on Facebook. And Kim, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Well, I I would really like anyone who has anything to do with lost cats to realize how important it is not to give up and you know not to assume anything. And also a huge myth lately about lost cats is putting out kitty litter. Oh, yeah. You know, there are a lot of people who think that this is some kind of like a magic wand. And it's really, to me, one of the biggest myths that gets circulated. Everybody on Facebook, you see, you know, say, oh, just put your kitty litter out. And I think it's not only does it not work, it's a bad idea. It can attract, especially if it's an indoor only cat, it can attract wildlife, raccoons, coyotes in some cases that smell the poop. And come to investigate. It can attract bully cats that are territorial. Who will then come chase your cat out of hiding. And, you know, it's your house smells more like home than a kitty litter box. So it's it's just silly. I would really like to help banish that myth. But there are a lot of people that really dig in and hold on to it. Yep. So everybody, do not put the kitty litter out. It does not work. Right. So, or food. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, Kim, I want to thank you so much for being a guest on my show today, and I hope we'll have you on in the future. I hope so, too. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to the Community Cats podcast. I would really appreciate it if you would go to iTunes, leave a review of the show. It will help spread the word to help more community cats. 